that Don Chamberlain has arrived, we can go ahead and start. I'm very aware of the time, uh, at, uh, starting at 2 o'clock uh, and proceeding uh, uh, on forward. I also am very aware that there's a, a weather storm moving in and everything else along those lines. And so I figure with, all me, with, with me speaking here today, all this hot air will be in this room. So it'll create a bubble and it'll just go right by us. We'll see how that goes. Uh, we are here today uh, to talk about the strategic planning process uh, for our great university moving forward uh, oh, and uh, uh, for the next decade, to be honest. But uh, the planning process uh, that will unfold will be over the next year. To start off, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Spazzy, who's going to click, click the number. Uh, Renee Pfister is the new uh, uh, Senior Presidential Advisor for Strategic Initiatives, otherwise known as Spazzy. And Renee will be instrumentally involved in this process as we move forward. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. One of the things that when we think about strategic planning is where we are now. And sometimes I think as a university community or any community for that matter, you lose sight of the amazing things that are going on at the institution. We have an incredible past 92 and past history of significant achievement uh, and uh, achieving great goals and being nationally recognized for our efforts. For 24 years, we've been rated in the top 10 as one of the top regional universities. We've recently received accolades of being of the best value. And to me, when we think about that word, best value, it's not the cheapest. It's the best value. And as an institution, as an institution of higher learning, we are the only one in the Commonwealth that received that designation uh, as a master granting university, or as a university at all, and we're being compared to top research universities, to top private universities, uh, at the undergraduate and the graduate level. And look at all the amazing ac top accreditations that we have, uh, be it in business, be it in, uh, in engineering, be it throughout the sciences, be it in the arts, be it wherever. These are the top accreditations. And for a university of our size and stature and outlook, to receive those type of accolades from our peers, which accreditation is, is absolutely amazing. So we are coming from this with a great deal of strength. And just over this past year, each one of you in your own areas, in your own departments, in your own colleges, can think about the amazing achievements that have occurred. And, only, and only, that's only in the past year. If you look back during the past decade, that trajectory of significant achievement is alive and well. So. That obviously would beg the question, if we're doing so great, why plan? There are some major significant shifts going on in the macro world of higher education. And these shifts, singularly, if they came one at a time, probably would not alter our thought, alter our, our strategies, alter our course that much. But all of these are hitting at the same time, the economic forces. And a lot of times when we think about economic forces, we're thinking about the Great Recession uh, and whatnot. But just think about how we are thinking about the economics of higher education and what does it mean for a graduate of a, of a university to have and to be. And also thinking about what those students are incurring while they're here. Here I'm not talking about the great knowledge that our professors are employing on our students, but the amount of student debt the amount of privatization that is going on through our public universities. And the economics, as we think about the future, what are the jobs, what are the opportunities, what are the careers that our graduates will be having? And how will that impact the manner in which we teach? Also, who we teach. Think about the influx of a non-traditional student. Think of the influx of individuals going back to be retrained time and time again because knowledge is changing so fast in order to keep up with the economic changes. They, too, need to be retrained. Demographic shifts, hitting each of our areas in many different ways. But here in the Commonwealth, specifically in our primary market, demographic shift is showing less and less first-time freshmen of our target audience. The diversity and the ethnic background and the racial, racial backgrounds of our students is also significantly changing. Also with the demographic shifts, the widening gap of socioeconomic status. Something that we all know that public higher education is to address. 
but we're seeing a widening of that gap. And how will that also impact us as we move forward? Technology continues to expand and to grow. I remember, and I'm not that old as compared to uh, Don Chamberlain's and the like, <laughs> but I remember when I was a freshman in college having a punch card for our registration process. And I remember our enterprising students going to the, the popular classes and grabbing seven of those punch cards because that was your key into the class. Now it's all done online. I remember the great advances in the computer, computer uh, area of my university. And the computer literally would fill this entire room. But in our pockets, we have more computer power there than we did then. And it's expected that we have and harness that technology for us at all times. But I also think of the other elements of technology and how it's impacting the way we teach, the way we communicate, the way information is spread. Many of you have chosen to be here today for this insightful lecture. Thank you very much. But many of our faculty and staff, uh, even alumni, are at home or in their offices watching this. And a mere 10 years ago, five years ago, that would not have occurred. One of my favorite governmental oversight and accountability measures. I use the code word on this, unfunded mandates. I hardly to think of how many positions that we have hired just to report on how we do things. We just released, for example, our safety report. Universities typically have to release about seven to eight different safety reports, repeat, reporting very similar types of incidents, but in very different formats. And as I look at Renee Duncan and others, just think of all the reporting activities that they get to do. On November 20th, I had the fun opportunity to go to CPE to report to them. And then we're going to go to another organization to report to them. And we got the board and all these different types of, of oversight. And then I also think usually that was always on the state level. Now the federal level is dramatically increasing it with the, with the federal uh, scorecard. One of the things that, would, that they're talking about is a, is a, as a measure of accountability is how much are your graduates earning in salary five years after graduation? Think about that. And think about the changes that that could bring about. I'm not talking about is it a good thing or a bad thing. I could argue that to the cows come home. And I do not think it's a good thing. But that is the environment that we are living and working in. And in the competition. One of the great things about American higher education is, in fact, it's based on a competitive model. Universities have always competed for students, competed for resources. We, we, we have always uh, competed for the, for the best and brightest faculty research grants, and whatnot. But that level, of, that level of competition just among the publics has significantly increased. I've been here now three months. And I don't know how many times I've looked into the Paducah Sun, which is a subpar newspaper compared to the Ledger Times, my I add. <laughs> Flattery, right? Thank you, sir. Reported the president of Western Kentucky, the president of Northern Kentucky, the president of the University of Kentucky, whomever, going into those areas and working with our community colleges, working with our school districts and whatnot. Just this week, there's another president coming to be the Paducah Rotary speaker, who I won't mention his name at this particular time. That level of competition is significantly increasing. And then you throw on the privates, then you throw on the for-profits. And we're all fighting for the same students, all fighting for the same resources, and doing it in a very, very different way. One of the outcomes of this, and one of the things that I think as Murray State we need to be thinking about, and we'll talk a little bit about later on, is the privatization of public higher education. The privatization of public higher education because we are becoming more private-esque. We're fighting and competing and we're driving. And at the same time, many elements of public higher education, let me rephrase that, many elements of higher education as a whole is becoming a commodity. We're all competing on price. And so when we think about our future, how do we shift that? How do we think about not competing just on price and just becoming another, com another commodity? All of these factors add up to great stress, what I call the golden triangle of higher education, specifically public higher education. Public higher education in America was set on the standard of making sure we are always affordable, making sure that we have had tremendous access to students, and with very, very high quality. 
during the, the 40s and 50s, during the boom of public higher education, this triangle was easy to meet. We had a, a, ex, excellent and, and exponential growth in federal funding. We had amazing growth in state funding. And we were able to apply those dollars to make sure that we were accessible, that our tuitions were always low, and that we had high quality outcomes. This was at a time when public higher education was literally funded 90% by the state and federal government and the students and their families had 10% funding. In, in Murray State's recent history, 15 years ago, that number was about 60% funded by the state and the government and 40% by the family. It has now not only flipped but gotten worse. 20, 25% or thereabouts is funded by the state and 75% is funded by the federal government. And that also adds in itself issues of access and affordability. And also, we cannot continue to rise tuition out time and time and time again. And so we need to think about how we will focus in on those quality measures. As a good friend of mine, a good mentor of mine said, we could probably do two of these very well, but not all three. But when we think about the accountability measures, when we think about our own self-worth as educators, we want to do all three. As I've mentioned, Murray State is doing some great things. We have amazing advantages to build off of as we think about our future uh, over the next decade or so. We have amazing traditions and history. There is a sense of what a Murray State graduate is. In fact, we codified that in the expectations and the outcomes of a Murray State graduate uh, and the, the ideals of a Murray State graduate. We have amazing community-wide support. In my three months traveling around the 18 counties, very few times have I run into a, a, a situation where there was more pro for another university than for Murray State University. And to have that zeal and to have that expectation is absolutely amazing. And I also have to say that's not just limited to our 18 counties. As I travel throughout the Commonwealth through other counties and whatnot, there is always a, a, a panache and a heart for our university. We are extremely student-centered. Many universities say that, but how many can actually point to the fact that they live it? We have more examples of our faculty and our staff working with students and putting the goals of the students above that of the rest and really bringing home that nature, that, 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 that feeling of student-centered. We are also an extremely engaged public university throughout our region. You cannot go into any of the smallest towns or hamlets or villages and not find a way in which Murray State is reaching out to those communities and helping them solve, solution, solve problems and presenting solutions. It's also an important part as we do this. It's not the big bad brother of Murray State coming in and saying this is how we're going to do it. It's working with the community members. It's working with those areas and working together. And again, that builds onto that community support. We do have indeed exceptional academic and co-curricular activities. The first slide is evidence of many of those elements, but also when you think about being the only public university with a comprehensive residential program, with the number of organizations that we have, and again, focusing in on making sure that this, the whole student is learning throughout the time. I also have to comment on the, 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 the culture that we have here and the, the environment that we have on our campus and the energy that is in existence in the faculty and the staff. At many universities, especially at this time, when you go on the campus, there's a, there's a cloud hanging over that campus. I shouldn't say that today since there is a cloud over our campus, but that's beside the point, figuratively speaking. Here, there is such passion for not only where we've been and where we are now, but for the future and optimism for that growth. And to me, that is an important part that we build off of. And again, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we have amazing research opportunities and partnership opportunities that we're continuing to, to seize. Like any institution, like any organization, we do have amazing things. But we have some challenges, too, that we need to be really thinking of. We are in an area where our traditional market is declining. There will be fewer high school graduates ne uh, next year and the year after the year after than there are now. Uh, I think next week, Jay, the state dem dem the, uh, demographer is coming, and he will emphasize that point. We are in a declining market. And I see some business professors in the area. What do you do when you have a declining market? You do two things. 
You need to expand the market and also increase your market share. We need to be very much thinking along those lines. This past year, we have had amazing admissions efforts, but we, are admitted, we have admitted fewer admitted and enrolled fewer students than in the previous year at the first time freshman level. Our transfer students are up by about 80, which is great. But when we look at the forecast, the number of students in our area who are going to community colleges is also declining. So we do have some, some and, and combine this, as I mentioned before, the competition for the students is getting extremely intense. Another trend that we need to be very aware of more and more of our freshmen are in need of remedial courses. In fact, more and more of our freshmen are in need of two or three remedial courses. The challenge we have there is we cannot always just concentrate on the numbers, but we need to be thinking about making sure that we, when we admit a student that they have a pathway towards graduation. When students have more and more remedial courses, several factors come into play. The first one is they're taking classes and paying for those classes that do not count towards their graduation. They're going to be in, in college longer. That means higher expenses. That means less time out in the workforce. We also know that the higher, the, the more remedial courses, the likelihood of graduation, of achieving the goal of, of graduating from Murray State University is lessened. And so as we think about those students that are coming to us with two and three remedial courses, we will see pressure on our retention rates. We will see pressure on our graduation rate. And there's maybe some of them wrong. <laughs> so we need to be thinking very carefully about those efforts and how do we make sure again, when we admit a student, that they have a probable graduation, a pathway towards graduation, and what does that mean for our current efforts and more importantly for our future efforts. We also need to be thinking clearly about, especially in our 18 service district, what is the value and the perceived, more, more aptly, the perceived value of Murray State University. Maybe it's not surprising. Maybe it is. I don't know. But the further away you go from Murray State, the image of our university academically increases, increases significantly. Recently, SPASI, I love the saying that, Renee provided me a map that was actually done upstairs or around here uh, through our GIS, GIS program. And it mapped the number of students and their ACT scores. And it looked like a weather map, literally. The further away, the darker the colors, indicating the higher the ACT scores. And for some, and that's not necessarily totally unique to Murray State University, but it also reinforces this notion that the competition, or the, the, the image of Murray State locally is a lot different than afar. And as we go out further, the academic reputation significantly goes up. That also may lead into a discussion that we had at the foundation board uh, of trustees just this past Friday with regards to our honors program, the Commonwealth Honors uh, Program, GSP, and et cetera. We are not getting our fair share of the top students locally. We have seen more of our top students go to other universities, again, having a perceived value that is better afar. Now, granted, the grass is always greener on the other, and there's always exceptions to that rule. But we need to be be, be thinking and being very diligent on how do we make an overt strategy to maintain our top students here at Murray State University and how do we, how do we work on that area. I mentioned before our rankings. And we are very proud of our rankings and we should be. But over the last several years we've actually seen a slight decrease in our rankings. And coupled with that, our top peers are increasing. So again, we have some challenges that we need to take on. So when we think about the plan, I'm always reminded by, and this was part of the, the letter I sent out maybe a week or two ago, a quote from Clark Kerr, and it is truly a test of a modern university of how we adapt to the changing environment, how we change and meet the new needs of our, of our students, how do we meet and change the new needs of our region. And I do believe that there are some very important possibilities in this effort. So as we start our planning process, I think it's important that we outline some of the, the principles, some of the ideas uh, that we move forward on. First and foremost, it's data-driven. Data-driven and data outcome. Now, some may look at that and say, oh, numbers can't tell everything. You're right, numbers can't tell everything. But there are some key numbers, there are some key 
benchmarks that we should be pointing to to say, are we achieving what we set out to achieve? How do we objectively say that we're doing this or not doing this? And how do we use data to make better decisions throughout the process? Another very important part of this is that there has to be a thoughtful dialogue. And this be a very inclusive dialogue. It would be very simple, not very good, but very simple for me to say, here's our five goals, six goals, here's the objectives, here's the goals, go out and do it. A, I don't think that would be successful. B, I'd miss a lot. You know this institution a heck of a lot better than I do. And it is through the collective wisdom that you all have and the thoughts and ideas that you bring from your dis different areas of discipline, your different perspectives, your different units, that will make this a much better plan. As I mentioned before, it's data driven on the input, but it's also got to be data driven on the output. As we develop this plan, we will have very specific measures uh, and, and it measurable outcomes of where we see to go. Right now, for example, we have roughly a 53% graduation rate. Is that the right number or should it be higher? Should it be 58 to, to match or supersede uh, the University of Kentucky? Our retention rate is hovering around 72%. What if we set specific strategies and said our goal is to have that to be at 78%? Again, with the exception of the 72%, that 78 is a number that can or cannot be achievable. That is for the, the committees to be thinking about. And through this process, too, I think it's important that we stretch ourselves, that we just don't set goals that would be easily attainable and mark it off. A public university is about transcending and transforming lives. And if we set average or, or very easily attainable goals, will we, in fact, be living up to our, our mission of transforming lives? I'm also a firm believer that when you do a strategic plan, it doesn't do any good to do the plan, put it on the shelf, eight years later, dust it off and say, did we make it or not? As we develop the plan, as we develop measurable goals as we measure the outcomes. As part of that will be timelines in which we will annually review comprehensively the plan. But there will also be, I foresee, elements within the plan that will be reviewed and discussed and modified, uh, modifying the strategies on a quarterly basis, a semi-annual basis and whatnot. But be forewarned, I guess, Jay and others, vice presidents, that this will be a comprehensive review every year. And it will be a public review because it's important that these goals are not just for one unit or another. It is for the entire university. As part of the planning process, too, it's also we need to be thinking about how we allocate our resources. And when I say resources, most people think dollars. That's obviously part of it. But focus, time, attention, human resources. Where are we going to spend our energies? Where are we going to, to uh, deviate? and spend more of our focus and focus on other things, maybe not quite as much. I'm also interested, too, as part of this planning process, to be thinking about and how do we create this notion of, 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 of various areas, departments, academic units, uh, programs and services, to take calculated risk, to try something new, and in that process be rewarded for successes. That, too, is something that we need to be building into and thoughtful of this plan. And finally, I think it's important in that we acknowledge, acknowledge that there is truly a spirit de corps at Murray State. How do we reinforce that sense of community? This is not, the goal here is not to change our culture and not to change the way we interact with one another, but to actually reinforce it. And to also bring in the various elements and make this a community-wide effort. As we'll talk about in a moment, we do have four goals or four uh, themes. Each one of those four themes is built on the other. And that succeeding in one will not create success for the entire university is how all four move forward. When we think about our strategic planning process, I do think it starts you know, with a vision. A vision was created, a strategic directions vision statement was created for this institution back in 2012 or adopted in 2012. And it's very well done, and it's articulated basically that the Murray State University is the university of choice for our students, for our faculty, for our staff, 
for, for uh, research and grants, for our communities, for the Commonwealth. And our effort is to actualize and make U Murray State University clearly the university of choice. And some people have, I've floated that idea around and people have asked me, what do you mean by university of choice? When we are recruiting the students and all of the students say that we are the top choice, we are starting to realize that we are indeed the university of choice. And when we did our freshman survey this year, 85% of the students said Murray State was indeed their university of choice, and that was a good thing. But we also need to make sure that when we recruit the, the top 32 ACT students throughout the entire region, that, that they put Murray State as their university of choice. When we recruit faculty, that the faculty that we're able to secure and come to Murray State, that this is the place that they would rather be than any other place. When we go around the Commonwealth, we want the, the leaders of industry, the leaders of civic organizations, the political leaders, and others to say when someone asks them, you know, I live in Frankfurt and I want to send my son or daughter to a university, where do I send them? We want the first university to come off those leadership's lips is Murray State University. And that's truly where we're aiming for the strategic plan. Now that I got a math person on my staff, I have to do Venn diagrams. What we're thinking about, what we're talking about, uh, through this effort is identifying what are we the best at or what could we be the best at? Where are our core ethics and values? And finances have to be part of the discussion. So what is driving our economic engine? And we could start thinking, I know all of you are thinking right now about those various different elements and programs that fit into one of those three boxes. Where the heart is is where they all intersect. Because that is truly where our sweet spot is, where we'd be able to be the, the most successful and really distinguish Murray State University above, above everyone else. Some of the core elements that are in existence, and these are part of our core values and, and some of the things that we do better than anyone else. We are student-centered. I've been at eight, nine different universities, and five of them said we're student-centered. Without a doubt, Murray State is the one that lives it the most. And I would also argue that anyone who visits our campus will come away with that as well. We are an engaged institution with superior educational and cultural experiences. Our academic programs are par excellence. We are developing bigger and better research programs and partnerships, and we need to continue to do that. And then also with the QEP, again, something that's setting us apart. Those are elements that, that fit, with, especially within two of three of those bubbles. One of the challenges that we will have are some of the notable changes that are occurring. Right now, the public universities are funded through the state based on what did you get last year, plus or minus X percent. That's going to be changing. More and more of our budget will be coming from performance outcomes. And those, those will be numbers that will be set by CPE and others. And they will include, for example, the number of graduates, the number of graduates in certain degrees, STEM age, the difference between uh, uh, low income and high income graduates and having that be narrowed, minority gap as well, progress towards a degree versus just taking classes. Those performance outcome measures are alive and well. They're being done in Tennessee and Mississippi and other. And you could just go on the, on the website and see the challenges that's occurring in Tennessee now with performance outcomes. There's one university in particular that has saw great retention growth, saw great graduation growth, and through that process received $3 million less than they did the year before. I also have to find it ironic that here in Kentucky we're putting high education quality in Mississippi in the same sentence. But that is what is occurring. The accountability metrics, state and federal. There is more and more accountability measures. And these are not necessarily accountability measures that you and I as educators would say are of paramount importance. They're not necessarily about learning outcomes. They're about degrees. They're about salaries. They're about job placement. And these are the things that we will have to be thinking about. A gentleman, a president at one of the Tennessee schools 
said to his faculty just recently, if your program is not graduating more graduates this next year than this year, be ready for cuts. I do not want to get into that, that dilemma. I do not want to get down that area. But those are things that we need to be thinking about. The mobility of students is dramatically increased. We, I just saw recently a report regarding the, the, the students who have transferred out from Murray State University. And I think you might be surprised to know that we have two, two modals. One modal is those individuals that have low GPAs. And they're transferring to community colleges and whatnot. We also have another model of, of, of high transferred out, and they are our students with 3.5 GPAs and higher from Murray State University. We need to be really thinking about what will maintain the students here at Murray State University from not only their freshman to sophomore year, but from sophomore to junior, junior to senior, and to degree as an undergraduate, and then hopefully retaining them here for our master's degrees. And then I also mentioned earlier the privatization of higher education. When, when we are charging our students and their families more and more for the burden of higher education, they are looking at those private benefits. To me, this is one of the, the biggest challenges, ethically speaking, of public higher education because we are losing sight of the public good. So how do we reinstate that and how do we put a value on that? How do we put metrics on that to prove that it's of, of importance? So as we develop our strategic planning process, there's five questions that I put forward, uh, and I think uh, Renee passed some of these handouts out, and these will be the questions that, that the committees and others are, are wrestling with. What truly differentiates Murray State from our competitors? And at first, I had universities down. But to be honest, it is competitors. We need to be thinking wide and global about Murray State and how we think about our competitors. What is the perceived value of that differentiation as well as the real value of that differentiation? Because that will also answer our, our uh, economic engine to make sure that when we come up with these great ideas that we can actually pay for them. The and that gets right to the next one. What are the economic costs and benefits of that differentiation? And how do we make sure that that differentiation is maintained? We talk a lot about for example, that we are the only public, uh, re, uh, public uh, university that has a comprehensive residential program. And it truly is unique at this point in time. We have Don Roberts and his crew are going to a, a conference hosted by Virginia Tech on this very nature as more and more universities mimic, copy, and try to replicate what we've done here. So how do we advance our residential college so it is always at the cutting edge? And what is that next big thing? In 1996, to help with retention efforts and recruiting efforts, the residential college was born. And it was a novel idea. What is that next big thing for Murray State that will help us differentiate? And then finally, what is our focus? When I was interviewing here six, seven, eight months ago, that was a big discussion. Who are we and what is our focus? Those are the areas that we're looking at. To help frame our strategic planning process, to help guide it, we've created four broad-based goals and themes. How do we advance the culture of academic excellence? As I mentioned before, I mentioned many times, we do have an amazing cadre of academic programs. But how do we advance those efforts? How do we make sure that we just don't rest on our laurels of the past, but are seeking the great new ideas? How do we promote a dynamic and diverse university community that is truly continues to be focused in on our student success. And, I, and the key words there are dynamic, diverse, and success. What are those areas that we can focus in on? What are those strategies, that, strategies and tactics that we can employ that will ensure that we maintain those efforts? How do we continue to foster an environment of inquiry and advancing uh, research and scholarly activities? How do we create new knowledge that, is, that can be applied to solve the great problems of today and tomorrow. And then finally, how do we continue to improve the quality of life throughout the region that we serve? And to me, that region right now is defined by 18 counties. I do see us in this effort truly expanding that. 
and thinking how far do we need to go and how and the different types of communities that we need to be serving. We have established a committee for each one of those. They have a very complex and simple task, all task, task all at the same time. Develop the goals and objectives for each of those themes and formulate the measures associated with them to know when we have achieved them and making progress to those efforts. Again, those need to be objective, they need to be measurable, they need to be able to be in a point in time where we can say we're making advances or are we not and how do we focus our efforts uh, in those areas. And we also need to make sure that we connect with the various other measures and metrics that we have in place, the CPE being for one and also other guideposts as well. We've established a structure in place to help facilitate these discussions and to move forward over the next year. We have the four committees. They are in place. They have uh, members appointed to them. But also I will say that those, that is the starting point. As, you, as we unveil and as we go forward, these committees will have meetings throughout the year. There will be open houses or, or university halls where they have discussions. It's imperative that you engage in this. As one person once said, democracy is a contact sport. It is not made for spectators. The planning process that I envision, that we envision, is just that as well. We cannot just do it in isolation. We, we truly need the, the active engagement of all involved. We've established an executive committee to make sure that the work of one committee is, is in concert and conjunction with the other. Because as I said before, we cannot do this in isolation and not, and not in, in silos. The work of the executive committee will be informed by the Dean's Council, the Chair's Council, the Faculty Senate, the Staff Congress, Student Government Association, and probably about four out of five other boxes, but internal to the university uh, as they develop their plan. The executive committee will also then present me various drafts throughout the area in which I will make sure that the external communities are engaged in this process as well. Again, as Murray State is a vital part of the economic, cultural, and civic uh, engine of our region. It's important that we also have the external uh, in, engaged in this as well because it will impact them. And then finally this is a Board of Regent decision. They are empowered by statute to approve the strategic plans of the university. We will obviously keep them involved in the praise as we move forward. We will be giving them updates uh, at the December meeting, then at the February meeting, and then hopefully in June we will present them a plan that they will say is the almighty best ever and endorse it and we will move forward and begin implementation starting July the 1st. And to me this plan stretches to two, uh, from, uh, from July 1, 2015 to, to uh, June 30th, 2022. In, in essence, it will wrap out the first century of Murray State University. And that is also not only done symbolically, but it's also done in conjunction with the fine work that the provost and his committee did with MSU 100. Those two plans, the academic plan, will merge very nicely and very importantly with our efforts in terms of academic uh, excellence uh, and uh, the scholarship and research components. These are the members that are part of the, the executive team. Uh, Dean Tim Todd and Bob Jackson are co-chairing it. The executive committee also has the four, chair individual, the four chairpersons uh, for each of the areas. Each of the vice presidents sit on the executive committee as well as the faculty regent, the staff regent, the, the, the student regent. So I think it's important, again, we have that, that, con that condensed group. And then we also want to make sure that we have very strong communication efforts. And so we have uh, uh, Catherine Sil uh, Silas, uh, Kelly Wisner with her great data information, uh, and then also uh, Mary Bradley, who, is, who will be the new editor for the student newspaper, will also be staffing that committee. At this point in time, what I'd like to do is start with uh, Dean Todd and Bob Jackson. I, Bob's there, I lost Dean, there's Dean Todd. If they would stand up briefly and just talk a little bit about, from their perspective, uh, their work uh, on leading this plan. And I'll...
live discussion going on. As President Davies pointed out earlier, and I think this is vitally important, we encourage everyone to participate. And obviously none of us can force anyone to participate, but this would be a much better roadmap and a much better plan uh, with more heads in the room and more participation by all. So we've started the process a few days ago. It's going quite well, and uh, we encourage, again, through a number of means, uh, your ideas and input. There will be a website going up in a few days that will allow you also to submit thoughts and ideas uh, as well. So we'll be uh, gathering data a lot of uh, different ways. And you may want to touch on maybe some other speakers, outside speakers, that, that may be coming in. Uh, in, in the weeks and months ahead, maybe to cause us to think a little uh, as it relates to our, our job is, all of our job, is to make a great university even better. And uh, that's what Dean Todd and I have been charged with from the president. Before you sit down, Bob, just, I think he's a snazzy dresser. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> Dean Todd, would you like to add anything? Just very quickly, Mr. President, I echo everything Dr. Jackson Uh, Dana Byers, is she? Here. Thank you. We, our friend and I weren't sure what you might call us. We were waiting for our names, but. <laughs> I'm Dana Byers, and I am chairing the Academic Excellence Committee. We met last week, and um, we really, it was an organizational meeting, and we really focused on um, the importance of transparency with this group. Um, so we will have our first town hall meeting November the 3rd in the Ruthie Cole Auditorium of Mason Hall at 2 p.m. And we uh, welcome your input, your thoughts, and comments as we move forward with our discussions. Thanks, Tina. So uh, I'm Fred Dietz. I'm overseeing the Student Success Committee for the, uh, for the strategic plan. Uh, very similar to Dina, we had our first meeting October 6th, and we are beginning to flesh out some themes within, within our first meeting. But for us, we're, we're really trying to define what student success is. So that really is our first task. Uh, we, we feel that in order to promote student success, you certainly have to know uh, what the definition is. So that's our first meeting. We have a great committee. Uh, it, goes across academic affairs, student affairs, staff, so uh, it's, it's, it's going really well. Like Dina, our um, town hall meeting will be October 29th in Rather at 2 p.m. Thank you for the pass. The, uh, the one that I'm working with will be the Community Engagement and Planning Committee. Uh, as you can expect, this is a very broad committee because, as we all know, Murray State affects not just Murray, Kentucky, but the entire 18 county, county service region and beyond. Many of our students come from Southern Illinois, Southeast Missouri, and I can see products of all those areas in this room along with Kentucky. So we really will have a very broad scope. Uh, some of the issues that we're really going to look at and try to focus on will be the economic development, you know, internships, if I see a lot of faculty in the room, how does that affect uh, what we do as a, as a university and the community engagement which we take part in? Uh, academic outreach, workforce development, governmental relations, and the list could go on and on and on, but we won't do that today. We have already met once as well, uh, had some great dialogue, and we will be hosting our town hall meeting uh, the following week after the ones that you've just stated or heard, and that will be Wednesday, November the 5th, we're going to do ours over in the College of Business in the interactive television classrooms. And uh, that will be ITV room 104. That's going to be from 2.30 in the afternoon until 4.30.
we do hope that many of you will uh, take part because so many of you do help with our outreach at the university. Thank you. And I know uh, I'm Dr. Jacqueline Hansen, and I'm a proud member of the Scholarship Research and Creative Thought Strategic Initiatives Committee. And uh, we met last week also for a, a organizational meeting, and we we had a, a really good conversation about how uh, quality scholarship and research informs quality teaching. And we want to do all we can to lay a foundation so that our faculty and our students realize the importance of becoming uh, action researchers and active in, uh, in their scholarly pursuits. Our first town hall meeting is going to be October 24th at 3.30 p.m. in the business building 404. So there's a lot of fours there. We have 24. I guess at 3.30 doesn't quite fit, but anyway. <laughs> Hope to see you all there. Back light and go ahead and flip. One of the things that Bob just mentioned as well, and these are uh, all the times uh, and dates uh, for the for the university hall meetings that are upcoming. We also foresee uh, more university hall meetings uh, in the in the second semester, uh, February and whatnot, as as ideas and plans are, are brought forward. Uh, it is important to me that the plan itself is a byproduct in some sense. It's the actual process of the planet is also extremely very important. So again, I see this as very transparent. I see this very inclusive. I see this as very open. Uh, it's important, again, uh, that you're all involved and, and be able to express those various ideas. One of the things that uh, Bob just mentioned uh, is that we're also looking at and, and, and uh, other universities and how they've dealt with this process. Specifically, we're looking at two universities, uh, Truman State University and Elon. Uh, both of those universities 20 years ago got a surprise look there. I'm not sure that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, we're looking at both of those universities about 15 to 20 years ago. Both of those institutions were struggling mightily. Matter of fact, Elon was just making the decision, do we continue or not? Both of those institutions in their region are, and are ranked number one and have been ranked number one for the last decade or so. They truly have transformed themselves. And we have made contact with each of those institutions, uh, not only with the current leadership, but the leadership that was there at the time. And, and again, learning from them uh, and bringing them forward. We've established, we, and then we will uh, hopefully be able to bring those individuals to campus uh, to help us to think about things anew, to take a different approach, to take a different look, uh, as well as just for our own edification. I mean, I don't think we're going to steal the Elon plan verbatim. That's not the goal here. But they have definitely done some things very, very well. And we need to be thinking about how to move that forward. So again, sometimes the process itself is just as important as the outcome. And so we will be engaged in that process. Communication, as I mentioned, is extremely important. Today is the first of many university hall meetings. Today is the first element of that process. You heard all the committee members talk. They've had their first meeting. Those are organizational meetings. They have, they're not making decisions at that time, they're setting up, how will they go out and collect data? How will they go out and engage the university? So again, something very, very important. We are developing a website. As part of that website will be an electronic suggestion box, probably the most important feature. Uh, in that suggestion box, we can submit uh, ideas and thoughts uh, anonymously or put your name to it. Now, I would prefer you put your name to it because if we, if it, if, so we can follow up and have uh, clarifying discussions and whatnot. But I also know it's very important that, that everyone feels comfortable to be able to voice their opinion. Also, at any time, feel free to talk to uh, Tim or Bob or any of the committee chairs or uh, Renee or even myself about ideas. I think, again, it's very important that this is a very open process and a very transparent process. Uh, as the, we do, as we are able to finalize and put ideas, all the many minutes uh, from the meetings will be up on the line. We have developed a lot of already uh, data points, data elements that, are, that will be part of the website. Uh, and as these are fleshed out, we will continue to, to post and, and make that website very, very fresh and dynamic. 
as they say, that's my plan. I'm sticking to it. Uh, I know that uh, a lot of individuals have classes to teach, uh, students to pick up from schools as we're closing a little bit early. Uh, so if you do need to leave, feel, feel, feel free to do so. Uh, but if you do have any questions, any insights, any thoughts, uh, I and the rest of the team will stay here and answer those. Uh, but, but again, feel free if you need to, to uh, uh, leave. Uh, I won't, I won't, I won't offend me. So with that, any questions, any concerns, any topics, any jokes? You were given a comment sheet with the five questions. You feel free to fill that out or to highlight that when you submit on the online box. Um, that will help us move forward. So that's at your now or later. But anyway, uh, thanks a lot for your attendance. Thanks, Renee. Anything else? Again, thank you very much. Uh, this is going to be a dynamic process. It is one that I think will provide us a focus and a vision to move this great university even further and farther along. So again, thank you very much. Go Racers, and I'll stick around to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.